Checking con connection. I am now live. Um, Allie, will you tell me if you can hear me? <laughs> I will. All okay. right. I'm uh, joining the feed. Takes a moment. I, I think I hear you. I think I do. We do? You do? Do you really? <laughs> turn my phone off and turn it back on, guys. That was It was that simple. Of course, now the ad function is not working again. I'm so angry. <laughs> is there some, did I spill something on my phone? What's happening? <laughs> okay. Um, this is deeply frustrating. Okay, here it is. I see you. I'm adding you. Everything is working. Thing is right in the world. Oh, I see a request coming in. Okay, great. Um, guys, we did it. We did it. Did it. Oh. <laughs> um, this, I feel much more celebratory now than I did um, when we started. Uh, this is very exciting. All right, so now I'm going to try to, I introduced Allie. For, can you hear me? Can you turn off our, our, our call? Because then I, I hear you twice. I, I have turned it off and I apologize for that. That, oh, was, no. that, that was, was awesome. That was a rookie move. It's um, working! I'd like to point out to you guys that during this, uh, this quarantine time, um, my calendar has that on it. The future is wide open. There is nothing, nothing going on. Um, so th those of you who are still here, thank you for your patience and endurance. Um, this was a test of your loyalty and you passed. Um, I have with me, um, Ali Matu, am I pronouncing your last name right? Yeah, Ali Matu, oh, you got okay. it. Um, and Ali is uh, he's a psychologist who specializes in cognitive behavioral therapy. I, I get, they give this whole introduction before, but you would only have heard it if you could lip read because there was no sound. I heard it. <laughs> I heard it and I was like, yeah, that guy sounds pretty good. Um, <laughs> I don't think anyone else heard it. I, I, well, let me, let me redo the introduction. So. Um, Ali's a psychologist who uh, specializes in cognitive behavioral therapy, or CBT, which is not to be confused with CBD, that's something different, also helpful at times. Um, Ali uh, specializes in anxiety disorders uh, of many different iterations. Uh, he taught at Columbia University, he's been interviewed by the New York Times, he's been on Netflix, he's been interviewed by NBC and, and CBS and other outlets, um, and now your, your career has kind of peaked because you're on a CW Actors Instagram feed. Everything has been building to this moment <laughs> for you. Um, I, um, I, I, if I, if you're anything like me, you guys have been talking to lots of friends on the phone, catching up with family members, checking in on everyone. There is a pervasive collective anxiety right now um, that is grounded in real world fears and it makes a lot of sense but we also don't want to be carried away by it um, and and so I thought it might be nice to talk to Ali about um, strategies for coping with the anxiety that we're feeling what's normal what's not normal um, how we can help other people who are being um, crippled by fear at the moment um, so we have, uh, fo folks wrote in some questions already, and um, so we have some questions that we can pull from. Um, if you guys also, if you want to ask any questions in the comments as they scroll by, I'll try to catch that and, uh, and maybe ask some of those questions. Um, and um, yeah, I guess maybe, Ali, we could start with just talking a little bit about what you've seen so far since this Corona-19 uh, uh, crisis started uh, and COVID-19 crisis started. And, um, you know, what, what are the questions that people are asking you most um, and how are you answering? Yeah, well, Misha, thank you for um, making the space, for reaching out, um, holding this conversation. I think this is exactly what we need more of. We need community to come together and to really talk about how do we help each other. 
What I have seen is something I have never seen in my career before. And that is things that used to only appear for people who were really struggling with their mental health are the norm now. Mm -hmm. So um, it's really struggling with a lot of worries, having a hard time being able to focus, um, having some difficulty, um, just kind of always being on edge, going outside and being very hyper vigilant, being very aware of yourself, of people around you, of what you're touching, of people who come near you. That's something that usually only happens in cases like post-traumatic stress. Um, but now it's, it's the norm. It's actually something we're supposed to be doing. And then, um, not really having much of a routine or not doing much in the day and still feeling exhausted, um, still feeling tired, um, feeling a bit hopeless. Those are things that we usually only see with depression. And then um, going through this routines of like washing our hands, but never really feeling like we're, like we're clean, um, still having that little bit of uncertainty. Um, do I have this? Potentially have I, have I passed this to someone else? That's something we usually only see with OCD, but now it's, it's pretty commonplace. So that's kind of what I'm seeing now, is I'm seeing aspects of anxiety, aspects of depression, aspects of uh, PTSD, of OCD. These things are more the norm now, as we're all in the middle of this crisis. And that's not even to speak to people who have already been struggling with these things before, who are now under even more difficulty struggling with anxiety, struggling with depression, struggling with OCD, struggling with all these kind of things now while they might also be stuck at home. Um, just hearing you say that is comforting, knowing that, I mean, mm -hmm. some of the things that I've been experiencing, um, that, that sort of uh, vigilance, that being on edge when you're around people, um, it, it actually interferes, I mean, not even, and by around, I mean at a distance of six or 10 feet away, yes. but that, that adds an element to your, it, um, it, it feels almost like you're, I mean, it, and, and you are in physical danger, but it, that feeling of being in physical danger when you're in proximity with other people, being in proximity with other people normally for me is somewhat comforting. Yeah. It's having yeah. the opposite effect yeah. right now. And what you mentioned also about um, not, have, not feeling productive it, I was it, at the outset of this thinking, well, silver lining, this is going to be a nice opportunity to just settle in to do some creative work <laughs> and, you know, really do some writing and some reading. I haven't been able to read anything other than the news yeah. for the last two weeks. Mm -hmm. And I've been completely creatively shut down um, yeah. because of this ambient uh, anxiety. And I don't even think that I'm, you know, experiencing the worst of it, but also my sleep has been interrupted. Yeah. Uh, I notice that I'm waking up uh, in the middle of the night and staying awake for a couple of hours, uh, which is, you know, not really the norm for me. Um, so it's nice to hear you normalizing this. It makes me feel a little, a little bit better. Um, what, um, so, so you're, so that is sort of broad brush strokes, what you're seeing people say, yeah. um, what, 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 if any, tools other than letting them know that this is normal and a lot of people are feeling this, what other advice are you offering people? There's, there's so much. Um, there's so much we can, we can do that can, that can help us. And so uh, maybe I'll talk about big picture, some of the things, and then okay. um, there's so many great questions appearing now and the questions that have been submitted. So there's so much stuff for us to dive into. But one thing is that is like, know that this is what we're all going through. Like, I, Misha, I'm struggling with the exact same stuff you're talking about. Um, last, the, two nights ago, I woke up in the middle of the night with a nightmare. That's not something that usually happens to me. And um, last night, my daughter woke up with a nightmare. Like, it's not, you know, it's, um, none of us are, are functioning at 100% right now. Right now, we are in the middle of a crisis and we're trying to get through it. The whole world is sort of united in this crisis. So um, the very first thing is to have compassion for ourselves, that this is the norm. Um, it's, it's very hard to be productive in the middle of a pandemic. Um, our goal right now 
is to keep each other safe, to stay connected with each other, even if we might be apart, and to get each other through. It's not to be productive. It's not a time that any of us are functioning at our best. So we have to be compassionate to ourselves. No one right now is the perfect friend or partner or parent or child or probably even pet. We're all kind of struggling, so we have to really have compassion to ourselves and to each other. That's number one. Number two is some of us are like two weeks into social isolation or social distancing. I really like that term. I like physical distancing because we can still say socially connected like you and I are right now. But some of us are two weeks into it. Some of us are a few days into it. Some of us are one week into it. But the first challenge when you find yourself in this kind of situation is how do you develop a routine? Something that keeps each day grounded. And I know that's really, really hard, especially if you're someone who's already been struggling with anxiety or depression. But having something that grounds your morning, your afternoon, and your evening, it really helps. It really helps kids. It helps teenagers. It helps adults. It just it gives you something to make the day go a little bit easier as opposed to having like looking at your calendar and seeing nothing. My calendar looks exactly the same way. Like it was so full for the next eight weeks and now it's gone. And that is actually really scary, like looking into that abyss and not seeing anything because we're so used to having things around our calendar, around our day that that ground us, that give us something to look forward to. So we need that. So, for example, we have a routine in my family here. I have a daughter. I have my wife. We're sort of in shelter at home here together. It's been two weeks. So we wake up. We have breakfast. We FaceTime with my wife's family. Eventually, that gets us to lunch. And then I have a dance. I call it Daddy's Dance Hour, where it's my daughter and I. We kind of do a dance class for like an hour. After that, we have a snack. Then we FaceTime with my family. Eventually, that's getting us to dinner. We put her to bed. And then my wife and I watch one thing every day that helps us detach. So that's part of our routine. The other thing, too, that's really big, Nisha, you kind of alluded to this. We have to limit news. And we have to limit also social media because social media, for the most part, is full of coronavirus, COVID-19 stuff. We all know what our own limits are. But right now, it is – if you do spend a lot of time watching the news, reading the news, or in social media streams that are full of the news, it's going to make it very hard to control these worries. It's going to make it very hard to stop thinking about COVID-19. So what I've been recommending to everyone is you actually do need to have some updates, actually more on local news than national news right now. But what I'm recommending everyone is find a way to get your news once early in the day and once a bit later in the day, probably not before you go to sleep because that might make it harder to fall asleep. I've made that mistake a few times. It's not good. Don't recommend it. But I've actually – what I've found that's really helpful for me is to listen to the news. I've been – there's podcast updates, but I've been listening to NPR news because it helps me not to see the images. It helps me to get the information but not see it and not have to read it. It's about two to three minutes in the morning and two to three minutes in the afternoon. I hear about what I need to know both nationally and locally, and that's it. Other than that, I really try to stay away, Misha, because it's too hard for me. It's too hard for me to read news and to be reminded of all of this sort of stuff. And the other thing about anxiety is when we're worried, when we are scared, in moderate doses, anxiety helps us. It helps us to be more on guard. It helps us to prepare. But when we keep getting reminded about these things, it can lead to even more uncertainty, even more fear, and then we can just feel kind of paralyzed and stuck, or we can have even more worries that are harder to manage. And for me and a lot of people I work with, 
the more you get exposed to this information, the harder it is to deal with those worries. So routine, limit your news, limit your social media. And the other big thing here, and then I'm going to shut up because I want to hear from you. And I know we have so many questions. The other big thing is finding something that you can totally get absorbed in, finding something that can just totally occupy your mind and makes you feel like you're making some kind of progress. So the idea is absorption and detachment, something that absorbs you and something that detaches you from your day to day. So that might mean rewatching a show that you love and you know well, maybe Supernatural I can recommend. Or it might mean playing a game that you love. I know Animal Crossing, a lot of people love it right now because it's so different from the day to day and it's kind of calming and soothing. I've been actually going through old, I have them like all right over here. I have all my old family albums and I'm going through those with my daughter. She's never really seen them and she loves it. And to me, it kind of takes me out of my day to day. So finding an activity that you can get absorbed in and it helps you detach from your day to day life, that's a big one that's going to help us through these kind of situations. Are there other, what about meditation? Is that something that you recommend for people? And if somebody hasn't meditated before, is there a way that you recommend they start? Yeah, meditation. I find that meditation is helpful for me. Yeah, yeah. What kind of meditation? What's your process? I do insight meditation. So it's focusing on breath and sensations primarily on the body. But I've been doing that for a long time and I learned it at 10 day silent retreats. So I'm not, I actually don't really know what the best way for someone who hasn't been to a long retreat and hasn't had a lot of instruction to be initiated into meditation. I, yeah, I've heard a lot of people recommend mantra meditations as an easy way to start meditating, but I don't know if you have any insight into that. Yeah, what I love about meditation is that it gives you a way to get more focused on what's happening here and now. It gets you a little bit out of your head and out of worries and out of all the stuff you have to do and all the things on your mind and gets you kind of pulled into your body, gets you pulled into the here and now. So you mentioned two things that I think are great ways to start. So you mentioned breath and you also mentioned sensory. So one of the easiest ways to deal with intense emotions is to change your body's chemistry. And one way you can do that is by slowing down your breathing. So what that means is just slowing your breath. You don't have to worry about doing any kind of fancy breathing. There's a lot of breathing techniques, but you want to do a slow inhale and a slow exhale. We could just do that together. If everyone watching the stream wants to do that, I'll go into my therapist voice and just kind of soothe and kind of quiet things down a little bit. And all we want to do is kind of breathe in slowly, hold it, and slowly exhale. Let's try that again. Slow inhale. One, two, three. Hold it, and a slow exhale. And you can just keep going like this. You can do a slow inhale, focus on the breath, and a slow exhale. What this does is it triggers your, um, the calming part of your body. There's a part of your nervous system called the parasympathetic nervous system. Its job is to calm you down. And slowing your breath down, it triggers that, and it will calm your body down. Um, a few other ways to change your body chemistry, exercise can do it. Um, uh, there's something called a dive reflex, which is one of my favorite things in the world. Um, this is actually really great if you might be in more of a panic situation, but um, it's, I find it very moving. It's something that, Misha, you and I, every species on this planet who has a backbone, 
we all share this in common. It's the dive reflex. So if we get water over here in this part, it's kind of like if you wear a scuba mask, it's like this area, and you get water in your nose, and you hold your breath for about 15, 20 seconds, your body thinks it's diving into water. And it triggers that same part of your body called the parasympathetic nervous system. And it just calms you down because it helps you to survive if you're diving underneath the water. I've got a video on my YouTube channel about how to do this. Is this where you splash cold water in your face? Is that the vagus nerve? It's the vasovagal nerve is this main nerve connecting your heart to your central nervous system. And it just, yeah, it immediately kind of like slows down your heart rate. You want to be careful if you have a heart condition because this does slow your heart rate down very quickly, and it does lower your blood pressure. But it's splashing water kind of simulates it. But if you actually dip your water in, or if you dip your water, this thing is called a head. If you dip your head into water, you want to cover this area. About 15, 20 seconds will be enough to trigger the dive reflex. That's another one. So quick ways of reducing anxiety is slowing down your breath, getting some physical activity, the dive reflex. Getting back to meditation, though, slowing down your breath is a great way to do it. The easiest way into meditation, I think, is something called mindfulness, which is all it's about is getting really focused on the present moment and just experiencing it as it is. So you mentioned sensory details. I love that. So whether it is eating, like eating ice cream, let's say, or it's about listening to music or sitting in your room and listening to sounds, anything that involves a sense, so touch, smell, taste, what are the other senses? There's more hearing. Yeah, and sound. Yeah, 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 yeah. I'm still missing one. Sight. What was that? Sight. Yes, sight. Yes, okay. Yes, that's the one we're using right now. This is what happens Saturday morning when you're sleep deprived. If you do one thing and do it wholly and put your complete focus on it and try to notice it with a lot of detail, that's something called mindfulness meditation. And I like doing it with food starting out. So I'm drinking some coffee right now. If I spend some time like looking at the coffee and really describing it and then describing it without judging it, like actually looking at it right now. I don't know if you all can see it. If I do that too much, it's probably going to fall. But it kind of looks like Coca-Cola to me. So describing that, noticing the smells. Oh, it smells so good. It smells to me. It just smells like the morning. Kind of tasting it. This tastes, it's a little bitter, but that's okay. I'm not going to judge it. I'm just going to notice it and noticing how your mouth changes as you drink it. Really slowing the process down, diving into it. That's mindfulness meditation. You can do it with any sense. I like doing it with songs. I like doing it with music and just really listening to it. What are the lyrics? What are the sounds? What is that experience like for you? The stronger the sensations, the easier it is to do mindfulness. It's a great way into meditation. Great. That's so helpful. I got a question from someone here on the scrolling by. By the way, I had the questions that people sent in, but my computer seems to have died. The screen just has lines across it now. I don't know. The tech gods are against me this morning. But I saw a question scrolling by just now. Someone was asking. They said, I'm sheltering in place alone. What do you recommend for someone who misses physical touch? Oh, gosh. This is really hard. I think we're all really struggling with that right now. The thing we all want to do more than – I have never wanted to give my friends a big hug more than I want to right now. So we all are struggling with that. We're social creatures. We want that contact. So what I would say is I'm with you. I'm feeling the same way. 
Um, I want to I want to give you a big high five right now if it wasn't <laughs> not recommended by the CDC. Right. Um, so the first thing I would say is a big skill that we all need to find a way to do is somehow bring our offline support, our IRL support, the stuff we do in real life, find a way to bring it online. So as much as you can um, stay connected to people that you feel connected with um, through FaceTime, to, through chats, through texting, through messages, um, that's one way we can still get that social connection. And I would build that into your schedule. Like, um, I've got um, my friends from high school. They're my buddies. Big shout out to Lowen and Jamie. I love you guys. I try to see them um, every day for a little bit. Um, even if we're just sending silly gifts to each other or doing FaceTime, um, sending, seeing them a little bit. The other thing is we do need touch. Um, touch really helps us. So I would find things in your home that are soothing to you, that you like touching. I, I, my, my daughter has all these stuffed animals. She's in the next room over right now. I think she's watching some Disney stuff. Disney Plus has been amazing for us. Oh my God, I don't know what we would do without that right now. Um, but um, her stuffed animals are so soothing for me right now. Like just, just a touch. Like she has, she loves lions. We've got these three different lions. We all sort of grab them and touch them. And there's also a blanket that I love touching. And that's okay, that's soothing. Um, sensory stuff can very easily get us out of our minds. It gets back to the mindfulness stuff. So it's totally cool. Find a stuffed animal, find a blanket, find something you like. The other thing too, and I know this is hard for people and it depends on where you live, but social distancing, I like physical distancing and shelter in place depending on where you live, means you can still go outside for essential things. Walking your dog is an essential thing. For your mental health, going outside for a little bit, as long as you're keeping a distance, that is an essential thing too. We all need sunlight. Sunlight actually helps our internal clock, so we're not um, completely exhausted during the day. We all need a little sunlight. Um, we all need a little bit of fresh air. And if you want to go outside, and um, I, I'm recommending going into more open areas, more natural environments where it's very easy for you to stay away from other people, you can touch the grass, you can touch a tree, um, something that will, that will help you to feel connected and get out of your skin, get out of your head a little bit. That's okay, that is essential, your mental health is as essential as your physical health. Um, well, that sounds helpful. It also sounds kind of depressing. Like, uh, I know you miss touching humans, but you can hold a blanket at this moment. But, but I guess we have to make do with what we can. Um, I see a lot of people commenting that um, Jared, who is, uh, also works on Supernatural, is uh, watching this feed. Um, I don't know Hi, Jared. how to... I don't know how to ban a specific individual from, <laughs> from the feed, so unfortunately we'll just have to suck it up. Um, I, um, um, yeah, I think, um, I think that's a big challenge. I think people um, are, uh, are, are having to deal with these surrogates. You know, we're, we're, doing these yeah. vir like we're doing these virtual conversations. We're doing phone calls and FaceTimes with friends. Um, there is a little bit of a silver lining that I've noticed for myself and a lot of other people that I know, which is that we're reaching out to people more than we normally do. I actually yeah. am having more conversations with people now uh, than I normally do, uh, yeah. albeit virtually and, and not in person. And uh, I think your point about getting outside and making a point of getting outside is really critical. Um, most places with shelter in place, you're still allowed to go for a jog or walk, um, or you're, you're still allowed, as you mentioned, to hug a tree. Still a little sad, <laughs> but, but we take what we can get right now. It, um, if it helps at all, um, we have to remember that we are doing this for each other. We're doing this to help each other. We're doing this to stop the spread. And this is a really critical time right now, is if, if we're able to keep doing this, we might turn the corner and we might give everyone 
in health care who's fighting this a chance to really treat those people and make sure there's enough stuff out there to help them and we might keep this from spreading to our friends and our family um so that's why we're doing this so i think it is really helpful to think of the purpose the reason the meaning why we're doing this we're doing this for each other yeah that's a really good point um it's it's easy to forget that i mean i think we all fall into a more selfish pattern of how this is affecting me right now and that's a natural human response um i think we're all susceptible to that but it is um important to keep reminding ourselves that we're doing this for the greater good and that really is why we're doing it especially anybody i mean there are certainly lots of people probably who are watching this right now who are um you know they have uh underlying conditions or they're older and vulnerable and so there is a self-preservation that goes into it but most of us if we catch this we're just going to get sick and then we're going to get better but we'll we'll overburden the hospitals we'll make it so that somebody who is older and more vulnerable doesn't have a ventilator um or potentially like you mentioned we'll spread it to our parents or grandparents or elderly neighbors if we're not careful so we all do need to to be careful with that are you seeing any other questions roll in or do you have the question i've got wrote in before great so you can just interview yourself and i can go do something else uh well we can do that um so um misha there's one question um this is the, the second question on the list um mm-hmm. this comes from uh shelly which is how do you deal with being paranoid that you will accidentally pass it on every cough every time i'm slightly warm i'm worried i sit i'm worried i'm sick um there's a worry about passing it on to um to parents and, and things like that so um let me i'm gonna turn things around is that something you've been struggling with too is is you get these symptoms and you're kind of worried wait do i have it am i passing it on yeah there have been a couple of moments like that but i've also been we you know in our family we've been pretty well isolated from the outside mm-hmm. world so um i haven't had a lot of points of exposure in the last two weeks where i was worried that i was passing it on but you know uh children have uh symptoms of uh you know digestive problems my son was uh throwing up last night and coughing a lot um mm-hmm. and kept me up much of the night with that um and i can't help but wonder is that is that covid-19 are we yes. are we now a part of an of an infected family um i don't think it is i don't know how that would have come in but then again i don't know how something else would have come in to make it sick so yeah i think i I've, i've also talked to a lot of people who are like are are asking that same question like do i have symptoms is this is my chest feeling tight right now or am i just anxious and trying to parse yeah. that out i you know for people who um who you know don't think that they're sick uh normally i think a lot of us are like am i sick so, yep yep Yeah, I I've been experiencing the same thing and um I am just surprised that this Instagram live is even working. If you were up all night with your uh, with if there if it took, it took us 15 minutes to get it working and then I broke my computer. So I I Oh <laughs> uh, yeah, we're both not functioning well. We both had like sick kid stuff, nightmare stuff going on. So I'm just amazed that this is even happening. Um yeah, so this is something so one thing to keep in mind is this is partially anxiety doing its job um this is an extraordinary situation and it's it's okay to be more cautious and more concerned about these things we should be so what um there's two things to keep in mind is we need to know what the main symptoms are um fever is a big one cough difficulty breathing those are kind of the the big ones and if you are concerned about those symptoms if you are having those symptoms then um you should call some kind of healthcare provider they're going to screen you and they're going to ask you more questions they're the experts they're the ones to uh to talk to and they'll screen you and they'll help guide you on on what to do next the thing i don't want you to do i don't want you to get stuck in an endless loop of searching the internet for symptoms and like is this uh what about this rare thing like oh do you get this itchy thing on your elbow cuz i got this itchy thing on my elbow. like don't don't get stuck in that loop of searching on on the internet um the internet is not your healthcare provider 
Talk to a health care provider if you're worried about this. And then if they say, no, these are not the symptoms, sneezing, not a common symptom, diarrhea, not a common symptom, throwing up, not a common symptom. If they say no, then you have to sit with that and then find other activities to keep your mind absorbed. Don't keep calling a bunch of different health care providers. These folks are the experts. And to some degree, having a more caution about this is the norm. And it's what we should be experiencing during this time. I have one more question for you. I think it's something that I've noticed for myself. I tend to, I think, soothe myself by doing things like I feel like, all right, there's a problem, but at least I'm doing something about it. I'm trying to help or trying to solve this. And that's a coping mechanism that I generally have. And so confronting this, you know, this crisis, my impulse is to, all right, let's roll up our sleeves and figure out a way that we can contribute, that we can, you know, help solve this problem. But it feels incredibly frustrating and a little helpless when the thing that you can do is just close your door and stay inside and stay away from other people. It feels really limiting and really ineffectual in the grand scheme of things. Do you have any advice for that? Like, how do you feel like you're doing something in a situation where we're kind of overwhelmed by helplessness? Yeah, so helplessness is a big challenge of this whole situation right now. And we all need to focus on things that are in our control that we can do. And so, number one, Misha, you said it, is sheltering in place and staying with our small little units that we live with. That is a big thing. The virus does, coronavirus does not move by itself. It moves through people. It latches on to people. It latches on to things that we touch. And if we aren't moving, the virus is not moving. So I just want to think about, I just want to share how amazing this thing is that humans, this thing meaning humans, I sound like a robot. Robots say stuff like that. Like, humans are very interesting or aliens. I promise I am 100% a human. But, like, how amazing is it that humanity in a matter of days has become united around trying to stop this virus? And the way we stop it is by stopping our movements. It goes against every urge that we have. We want to connect. We want to see each other. We want to be there. We want to do stuff. And we are fighting every impulse we have as humans to stop this thing. Like, that's amazing. Like, I've never seen, I don't know if anything like this has ever happened in our history as a species that we're all united on this one goal. That's a very big thing. That's not us being helpless. That is us saying, no virus. We are not going to let you destroy our way of life. And we are going to do this thing to stop you. That's what we're doing right now. It's not a helpless thing. It's an active thing. So that's number one is, like, really connect with what we are doing here. And number two is let's focus on the stuff we do have in our control. So, Misha, you created this live stream. You created this event. This is something in your control. And it's one way that you're making a difference here. We also can focus on the things that we can do in our families, in our homes, things that are in our control. Is there something you really wanted to do? It doesn't have to be about trying to, it doesn't have to be COVID-19 related. But is there something in your home that you wanted to do? Is there something like, like, for example, I also have this, like, I'll show you because that's what the thing I'm doing. There's my light. But I've got this, like, closet that has, like, all these old electronics and cables and wires and stuff. I've just kind of been going through it and just trying to clean it out. It makes me feel like I did something. It makes me feel like I'm moving forward on something. So finding things in your day-to-day life that are in your control that make you feel like you're making some kind of progress. And, again, it can be as simple as Animal Crossing, just making progress in that game, whatever makes you feel like you're moving forward. Are you sponsored by Animal Crossing? You seem to be plugging that game an awful lot here. 
<laughs> I wish I was. I actually try. I don't even have a Switch. I tried to get a Nintendo Switch uh, before this whole thing happened. Yeah, it's like, too late now. You it's have to too late. Yeah, 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 yeah. Next Christmas. No. <laughs> um, I, I see a lot of people saying answer Jared's question, but I mm. don't know what Jared's question was. So can somebody repost that for me? Um, I, I, the way this is scrolling through, I can't look at all of the questions. Um, um, yeah, I noticed that I've been doing uh, exactly what you're talking about. I am trying to have some semblance of control, and so I'm finally like cleaning out my closet as well um, and finding some really haunting things in there that I didn't know. <laughs> um, all right, so well, is anybody going to post Jared's question? While we're looking for Jared's question, yeah. uh, Misha, should I ask another one from, uh, yes. from our, our thing? So um, there's a question from Renee about... Uh, how to find empathy or middle ground while living with people who don't seem to have much of their own to spare. So people who might um, have different views than you, people who might not be um, really believe in social distancing right now. Um, so how do we find empathy for these folks? So I'm gonna do the same thing I did last time. Um, what's your advice on that situation? Um, I, I mean, I think that at the, at the moment, all. It's a matter of um, understanding that everybody's coming from a different place. Um, yeah. A lot of people are tuning out the news. They're not thinking about all of the moving parts that are going into this collective action that we're taking. Um, as in, in many cases, an act of self-preservation. You know, I, I'm tuning this out. I don't want to think about it. Um, so we have to understand that. But I think we also just have to keep talking about, um, you know, this is important. And if we are collectively going to get a handle on this without having um, a, an unnecessary loss of life, then um, I think it's a matter of just being patient and, and trying to educate people. I know a lot of people who've gone through that with their own parents. My, yeah. I have like conversations with both my mother and my father who are you know, old enough and vulnerable enough that this could be quite dangerous for them, where they were like, oh, I, was, you know, I had 10 people over for dinner last night. Um, <laughs> And I was like, you can't do that anymore. All right, I think I found Jared's question. How can you let your friends and family know that your sadness right now has nothing to do with them not being supportive or present? Mm. Okay, I'm gonna answer both questions. Uh, Renee's question, um, as well as Jared's question. So um, Renee, you, um, you have to pick your, pick your battles right now. Um, Misha mentioned self-preservation. That's number one, is if, you, if you're living with family who has different political views than you, um, or doesn't necessarily, isn't following the things that you think are important to follow right now, um, number one is take care of yourself. So that might mean, you might need to even socially distance yourself from your family in your home, or the news that they're watching, watching or whatever it is to help you get through the day. And then um, the next thing here is, it, is trying to uh, find compassion for the things that you both share in common. So what are the values that you both share? Keeping um, each other safe and healthy is probably a value that you all share. Is there any way you can unite around that or unite around the things that you both do see to eye, eye to eye on and focus on that? Um, the other thing about um, Misha, I've, I've had those same conversations both with my in-laws as well as with my dad um, about like, oh, it's fine, I'm just gonna go out, I'm gonna do this thing. Uh, no, 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 don't do that thing. Um, really trying to uh, approach it from curiosity. Like, w w why is that important to you? Trying to understand that. And when I tried to understand that uh, with my dad, I found out that it was really important that he has connection to his community, that that's like at his age, that's one of the things that he looks most forward to. And I was trying to talk to my dad about other ways in which he can still get that while not seeing um, these people on a regular basis. So trying to approach it from curiosity. And if you're having conversations, my one of my biggest tips is um, asking this question, why do you think this is so important to me? That's kind of a quick way to short circuit empathy is by getting people to think about that. So that could be another way to think about it. Okay, Jared's question. 
Sadness, fatigue, exhaustion, all of these things are very normal when you don't have a routine, when you're not getting a lot of sunlight, when there isn't much in your schedule to look forward to, when there isn't much in the week to look forward to. All of those things are normal. But the other thing that's normal that Jared is getting at that, Misha, you and I haven't talked about that is super important is grief. There is massive grief here. And I'm not just talking about grief for people who might be sick right now or have lost their lives as a result of this, but grief for our loss of a lot. If you're in sixth grade, in eighth grade, in 12th grade, if you are a senior in college, if you had a big thing that you had scheduled, a spring break, something you were looking forward to, I was super excited to be going to WonderCon next week and had organized these panels. I was super excited to be there and to reconnect with friends. That stuff is gone. It's lost. And it's not coming back, at least not for this time. Like if you had a spring break plan, you're not going to have that spring break plan. If you're an eighth grader, your eighth grade has been completely changed. Like there is complete grief for real losses. And we have to acknowledge that, that we are all, not only are we dealing with disruption in our day-to-day lives and our routine, and that's going to make us feel sad, but we're also dealing with a real grief. Like not to be, this is going to sound silly, but like, I think handshakes are kind of gone and they might be gone for a long time. Like that, like COVID-19 coronavirus is going to change our culture. And in some ways for the better, in some ways for the worse, all of that means loss and change. And that means grief. It is normal to feel sad and we will all grieve and feel sadness in different ways. Some of us will want to talk about it. Some of us won't want to talk about it. Some of us will want to tell stories or poetry or make art or create something. Some of us will want to pour ourselves into other people's art and creations and stuff like that. We all grieve differently and it's important to grieve the losses we might be experiencing. And that sadness doesn't have anything to do with the people we love, our friends, our family. It has everything to do with this complete, um, unexpected, extraordinary crisis that we all find ourselves in. Um, Just to dig a little bit more into that question, um, how do you let your, how do you convey to your loved ones that what's going on with your sadness and your difficulty right now isn't because of them, it's because of this this bigger, these bigger issues, this, this grief, this loss, this uncertainty, um, this anxiety. Yeah. So I would say, think about how you handle really tough emotions. So for some of us, we not, we might not be ready to talk about it. Um, a comment just went by, like, how do I stop myself from panicking? Like if you're someone who, when you think about this, you start to feel a lot of panic, you might not be at a place where you're ready to talk about this right now. And to answer your question, not to plug my YouTube channel, but I've got a video on um, how to stop panic attacks. So for that comment, go check that out. I've also got a video on um, 10 ways to quickly reduce anxiety. So you can check that out, that might help as well. But like if, if thinking about this stuff is overwhelming for you, Maybe now is not the right time to to talk about it. Um, If you're someone who you like to just kind of write your thoughts down, I know a lot of people when something's really overwhelming, maybe it's easier for for you to just write it down just for yourself. Mm -hmm. Try that first. Or maybe um, if you're someone who likes to talk things out, think about one person that you feel closer to and more comfortable being vulnerable with and find a way to share some version of that, Misha. It might just be like, like, I'm really sad and I don't know why. And you can do that over text, or you can do that over FaceTime, or you can do that over email if anyone still sends emails anymore, I don't know. Um, But think about how you've dealt with really tough emotions in the past and um, try that out. And it's okay too, 
if you try and it kind of doesn't go well, because we're all really emotional right now, we're all really raw. You know, um, the hardest thing for me this week was when my daughter's two and a half years old. So she she knows that something's different, but she doesn't quite understand what. Um, three days ago, you know, she, she gets to watch more TV now. <laughs> yeah, 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 she does. She knows like that. Right now. <laughs> yeah. Um, she she definitely picks up on that and is asking about that a lot. Um, but she was crying and crying, and she was make believe pretending that we were in a car ride and we were going to the playground and we were playing, and it was breaking my heart. And um, then she started crying and crying, and she grabbed my face, pulled it in, and said, Daddy, I want to go to the playground with tears rolling down her face. I want to go to the playground. I want to go to the playground, which is absolutely one place we can't go right now. Um, and um, I just started crying. I just lost it. And we're all emotionally vulnerable right now. Um, I'm a big Trekkie, and um, I think about when, when Spock in the 2009 Star Trek movie said, I am emotionally compromised. Like, we are all emotionally compromised right now. So it's okay if you share, if you start this conversation with someone and you feel like you're losing control um, and you feel overwhelmed. If you're someone who struggles with that, um, try a grounding skill, something that makes you feel more present in your body. This is a little bit of mindfulness meditation, but this is also a coping skill. Five, four, three, two, one. Let's see if I got that. Yeah, five, four, three, two, one is a great coping skill. Focus on five things that you can touch, the feeling of your shirt, the roughness of my beard, the metal chair that I've got my phone on, Focus on what those five things really, uh, what, what the touch is like for them. Look at four different things in the environment and look and really kind of describe them to yourself. Listen to three sounds in the environment. Um, notice two smells in the environment and observe the taste in your mouth. That's a um, grounding skill that for a lot of people can help them feel less overwhelmed and more plugged in with their body. Or another way to do it, um, another grounding skill, if you find yourself feeling overwhelmed when you're having these conversations, is um, make a list in your head. Make a list of your favorite supernatural uh, episodes. Make a list in your head of um, your favorite places that you like to go in your local community. Make a list of um, your favorite songs. Something that will kind of quickly snap you out of whatever you're feeling, and it's not a list that's gonna run out anytime quick, uh, anytime soon. The reason why that works, and the, re the reason the sensory thing works is your senses are very powerful ways of getting you out of your thoughts. The reason why lists work is it sort of um, snaps into gear the more rational part of your brain, this frontal lobe, this part right over here, and it, it makes it a little bit easier to cool down the emotional part of your brain, the amygdala, which is in the more center part of your brain. It, it, it makes it easier to press the brakes on that. So abs Jared's question's a really good one. Um, it's okay I, to I hate, I hate to hear you say that. I, I, hate, to give, uh, I hate to give him that satisfaction. <laughs> I'm, just, I'm just trying to be nice, Misha. Um, yeah, I, I can tell, I can tell, yeah. Um, you know, one other thing that I've noticed, and I am in no position to be prescriptive here, but, um, I've noticed that I, I can get in conversation with people. I can get, when I'm really emotionally overwrought, I can have a hard time communicating. But sometimes if I sit down and I write something, I can compose my thoughts in a more uh, detached manner and, and my, my thoughts can really be conveyed a little bit more clearly. So that might be another thing to do with loved ones, like just write them a note um, that conveys how you're feeling and what's going on with you. Um, and another thing that I've been trying to do is take this opportunity to write people um, the things that I appreciate th about them. Um, yeah. And that seems to have a, settle a calming, settling effect on me and hopefully um, some sort of benefit to the people that are receiving them. Um, uh, <laughs> unless, uh, 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 your notice for coming. Um, <clears throat> Can I give two writing prompts that might help people? Yeah. Um, so there's there's two things to think about. So number one is 
if you're struggling emotionally with this whole situation, which I'm pretty sure describes 100% of the people watching and also on the street. Um, but if you're, if you want to explore that a little bit more through writing, here's a writing prompt for you. Um, coronavirus has impacted my life in this way. And just explore that, explore the impact. I've been impacted by COVID-19 this way. And on paper, don't type it, but on paper with your writing it out, the reason for that is it slows down the process and it does kind of force you to think through these things a little bit more and to find like a meaning and narrative. Um, that is something that can help you to kind of work through this different stuff. Uh, it's, it comes from a really great treatment that is used to help people um, who've gone through traumatic things and it's something that can help all of us. The other thing, Misha, gratitude is a super emotion. It not expressing gratitude not only helps you, the person expressing it, it also helps the person ex hearing it, receiving it, and it helps everyone else who witness it. Gratitude is this thing that is um, so, so helpful. So um, express gratitude to people that, it, it might be like totally unrelated to all of this. It might be like, maybe you had a teacher who helped you through a tough time and you're just kind of thinking about them. Like write them a note, send it to them. You have no idea if that's gonna be the thing that will help that person get through their day. Or if you are on one of those trips and you go to a grocery store, express your gratitude to the clerk and say, thank you for being here and helping to keep society running. You order something online, you have delivery. Um, if you see the person with the you know, distance, say thank you so much for making it possible for me to get this thing. Like, it's not just our healthcare uh, workers who are putting themselves in harm's way. It is um, everyone working in delivery, everyone working in restaurants, everyone um, working in grocery stores, in, um, in all the stores where we're getting our stuff. Express your gratitude to them. It's going to make all the difference in their day. I, um, we, we organized with our, our neighbors to put up signs in front of our houses, um, thanking healthcare workers for, mm. for their work and sacrifice and the risks that they're taking to keep us alive. And uh, a nurse uh, stopped uh, on her way to work and she said, I knew I shouldn't have put mascara on this morning. Now, now it's running down my mm. face. Thank you for making my day. She just unrolled her window and said that. Um, and it, and it, it's, it's amazing to think such a small gesture, you know, just, you know, this little shoddily made handwritten sign um, could have an impact on somebody. But, you know, especially when emotions are raw and people are worn out and frankly, everyone is scared. Hearing these things, I think, is really helpful and, and, and more meaningful than I think we would give them credit for. Um, but yeah, yeah, I think you're right. Um, it, I, it's I, something that, um, you know, I've been really worried about all of my therapist friends mm -hmm. because um, this is one of the first times when we were all struggling with the exact same stuff we're trying to treat. And um, it makes a lot of therapists really vulnerable for burnout and for um, something called compassion fatigue when you're just, you're out of juice, you're, you're done, you have no more energy left. And I'm hearing the same thing from all of them, which is when, when the people I work with, when they say, thank you, thank you for being here, or are you okay? How are you doing? That, that makes all the difference mm -hmm. because it helps you to connect with why we're doing this stuff. It helps us to connect with our shared humanity. And it's that simple stuff. It doesn't have to be a big gesture. Um, but it's just being honestly expressing your care, concern, and gratitude to another human being. That can be the thing that helps us to get through. That's like an emotional hug. You know, we all want to reach out to each other. Mm -hmm. This is one way we can do it without touching it. And it can make all the difference. Um, well, I, I, I'm wary of, of us running on too long here. And I, I think maybe, uh, you know, if you're game, we can talk about it um, offline. <laughs> but 
might be lovely to do this again. This feels Let's really again. helpful and, and people are, um, they're still watching here. Um, so yeah, maybe, maybe we should try this again sometime soon. Um, but in closing, I wonder if there's anything that you want, any resources that you want to point people to. I know that you have your own, um, your own YouTube series, so maybe you can mention that, but then any other resources or parting thoughts that you have for folks? 